Welcome back. In the last session, we looked at the choice of the 12 in the Lucan text. Then began our examination of the Sermon on the Plain, with the Lucan Beatitudes and the material on the measure of life before God. In this session, we conclude our examination of the Sermon on the Plain in Luke with the material on the need for action. Following that, we shall look at two miracle narratives, the cure of the centurion's son and the raising of the son of the widow at Nain. The third section of the Sermon on the Plain, the need for action, takes the two commands of the second section, love for enemies and not to judge, and examines each of them from various points of view. To do this, Jesus uses parables. That is, he takes some point from the common experience of the people and uses it to illustrate his point. The first parable begins with a rather unusual situation, a blind man leading a blind man. Since neither can see, they will not be of help to one another, and in fact both will fall into a pit. The point is, be careful who you follow, or you will find yourself in a difficult situation. In particular, be careful about following someone who is unclear with regards to Jesus' commands on love and judgment. The practical situation changes from the blind leading the blind to the teacher-student relationship in the next verse. A disciple is not above his teacher, Jesus says. But there is a time when discipleship is finished and the disciple is sent forth by his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully taught, will be like his teacher. So that one can say that a teacher's role is to impart knowledge and experience, that he, the knowledge and experience that he has to his or her disciples or students at the same time modeling what he or she is teaching. When complete, the teacher sends the students or disciples off to use that knowledge and experience. The teacher then takes on a different set of disciples and students. Some translations will say when the students have graduated. That would be more of a 21st century interpretation of the text. Putting the two parables together, if a teacher student has very little to impart to his students, then it is like the blind leading the blind. It is imperative that a teacher be prepared and have something to offer to his students or disciples. The next image is quite graphic. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? but do not notice the log in your own eye. We're quick to see the faults of others, as minuscule as they may be, but we're very slow to see the faults in ourselves, which may be quite a bit more serious. That's part of our human nature. It's always easier to see what's wrong in the world than to see what's wrong with ourselves. Jesus says, How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that's in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that's in your own eye. One should be self-critical before thinking about being critical of others. The point is then brought further home through repetition. To do such is to be a hypocrite, someone who pretends. The Greek word hypocrites is the word that is used for an actor in a play. Thus, the hypocrites is an actor taking on a role that is not true to his true self. The hypocrite is one who acts one way, but in reality is quite a different person. Put in another way, it's one who pretended to be something that one was not. Jesus cautions that trying to help others while, f while failing to know our own self can be disastrous. So what does one do? First, take the log out of your own eye. 
Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Get your own house in order. Know who you truly are. Get the faults corrected that you need to correct. Then you can be more helpful to others. Bach notes that this example is not peculiar to Jesus. The Greek writer Democritus, five centuries before Jesus, taught, quote, It's better to correct one's own faults than those of others. Close quote. About 70 years after Jesus, Rabbi Tarfon taught, I should be surprised if there was anyone in this generation who would accept correction. If one say to a man, remove the speck from your eye, he will rep reply, remove the beam from yours. Things seem to have become worse rather than better by Rabbi Tarfon's time. Many interpreters see the blind teachers and those with planks in their eyes as the Pharisees. Jesus' followers cannot be like them. They must know their own faults, deal with them, and then be ready to aid others. The parable again changes, this time to trees. For no good tree bears rotten fruit, nor again does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. Thus a reason is given for being self-critical. That which one produces is good. A tree is known by its fruit. So what are you producing? Is it good or is it rotten? Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. A tree produces what it's supposed to produce and nothing else. But that tree needs to be cared for and nurtured so that it can produce good fruit. So the process of removing beams from our eyes is part of what helps us to produce good fruit. Jesus then applies the tree parable to our lives. The good man, out of his good treasure in his heart, produces good. And the evil man, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. The fruit that we bear is determined by what is in our hearts. So strive to have good in your hearts to produce good fruit. Fitzmaier sees Luke teaching. If you want to correct others, you must first demonstrate your own goodness by good deeds. It's the good that one does that gives that person credibility when they wish to teach, exhort, or even correct others. The final line gives the ultimate principle. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The window into the heart is the words that we speak. When we summarize a meeting, we highlight the points that are of interest to us. When asked for directions, we give them in terms of places that are meaningful to us. When we wish to see what is in one, one's heart, listen to the words they speak. Our speech betrays us. The final section of the sermon parallels the finale to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew speaking of the foundation on which we are built. A question introduces this section. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Why do you acknowledge me with the honorific title Lord, and then do what you want, rather than what I am exhorting you to do? Being a follower of Jesus demands that one do what he requires, that is, what has been exhorted in the previous part of the sermon, loving and being non-judgmental. An example to illustrate what Jesus wants follows. Whoever comes to Jesus, whoever wishes to his, be his disciple, hears his word. That is, listens attentively as a disciple to his master and does them that is, puts them into practice in his life. This is the tough one. Many wish to follow, even come and listen. But when it comes to actually doing, they will fall short.
But the one who does put the lessons of discipleship into practice is likened to a man who builds his house on the foundation of rock. Having sunk the base of that foundation into the bedrock, as a result, when the weather became cruel and the storms bashed against the house, the winds and the water could not budge the house. It was built on rock. Now the opposite situation, that is one who does not put the lessons of discipleship into practice by doing them, is like the man who builds on the ground without any foundation whatsoever. The ground without foundation is quite shifting, and so any change in the weather would cause ruin to the house. When the winds and the water came bashing against the house, there was nothing to keep it from falling. And so it falls. Jesus' final command is that the ruin of that house was great. So the final parable of the sermon asks us a key question. What is the foundation of our faith? Is it bedrock or is it the shifting sands of the land? The spiritual bedrock is listening to and acting on the word of Jesus. A solid disciple will not be shaken when the storms and winds of change and other doctrine come and beat against the house of our faith. The shifting sands disciple will follow anything and eventually end up in ruin. Jesus rhetorically asks, where are you? What is your foundation? Here is a map of Galilee the site of most of the ministry of Jesus thus far. Much of what has happened occurred in or around Capernaum, which is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Sermon on the Plain has no named place, as also is the situation with the Sermon on the Mount. However, tradition has the Mount of the Beatitudes as the site of the Sermon on the Mount, which is just a short distance from Capernaum. It's possible that the plain where Jesus gave the sermon in Luke is located nearby also. After the sermon, Jesus returns to Capernaum to cure the, servants, the servant of the centurion, and then moves south toward the southern region of Galilee to the town of Nain, where he encounters the funeral procession and raises the son of the widow of that town. At the conclusion of the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus chooses to narrate these two miracles we just spoke of, in addition to an account of messengers from John the Baptist and an account of a sinful woman who's forgiven at the house of Simon the leper. In other words, Jesus continues to bring the good news of the kingdom to the people of Galilee. The change of location from the plain of the sermon to Capernaum is mentioned briefly by, by is mentioned briefly by Luke with the conclusion formula after he had ended all these sayings this is similar to the conclusion formula employed by Matthew at the end of each of his five discourses Capernaum is a key city in the ministry of Jesus in the region around Galilee immediately the main character of the narrative enters. He's identified as a centurion, a Roman soldier in charge of approximately 100 soldiers, 1 60th of a Roman legion. Herod Antipas was known to make use of non-Jewish soldiers as did his father, Herod the Great. Therefore, this centurion may have been engaged in policing, but more than likely, he was in custom service similar to the soldiers who addressed John the Baptist in chapter 3. Now this centurion had a slave who was valuable to him, who was sick at the point of death. The action is immediate. The centurion heard of Jesus and sends intermediaries, that is the elders of the Jews, to implore Jesus to come and heal his slave. The fact that the Jewish elders take an intermediary role, Nolan says, signals 
the fact that Jesus' deed of curing on behalf of this Gentile is acceptable within a Jewish framework. From the entreaty of the Jewish elders, it's pretty certain that the relations between the local Jewish community and this centurion were on very good terms. Many would see this centurion as a God-fearer, that is, one who was not Jewish himself, but accepts the ways of the Jews. A similar estimation is given of the centurion Cornelius, who appears in the 10th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. The Jewish elders tell Jesus that the centurion is worthy to have Jesus cure his servant. And what makes that worthiness? Two things. The centurion loves their nation, and he has built the synagogue in Capernaum. Evidence has been found for Gentile support of synagogues, and in one case, for the building of a Jewish, quote, place of prayer by a Gentile. As a result, then, of the entreaty by the elders, Jesus goes to see what the situation is. As he nears the home of the centurion, a second delegation is dispatched a group of friends of the centurion. They carry the message, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you come under my roof. The centurion recognizes that having Jesus enter into his home, the home of a Gentile, would render him unclean in accord with the laws of the developing Mishnah. In a sense, the roles have reversed for the centurion. The Jewish elders, in telling Jesus that the centurion has built their synagogue, show that the centurion has been a patron for them. He has offered them help where help was needed. Further, here the centurion is not wanting Jesus to come to his house, and that shows sensibility to the custom of the Jews. But more importantly, he has shown that he is subordinate to Jesus. He is, in the language of the day, client to Jesus, who now, for the centurion, becomes a patron. The delegation continues telling Jesus, because of this unworthiness, the centurion did not presume to come to Jesus. All Jesus need do is speak the word, and the servant will be healed. This is quite an act of faith, and that from a Gentile Roman soldier. As a soldier, he knows what authority means, and he gives examples. I say to one soldier under me, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. I say to a slave, do this, and he does it. That's the experience of authority that the centurion lives under, living with and commanding. But the centurion here recognizes an even higher authority in Jesus. He can accomplish what the centurion could not. That is, he can save the centurion's servant from near certain death. He can make him whole. He can restore his life. Hearing this, Jesus is amazed and marvels at what he hears, then uses it as a lesson on those who are gathered. I tell you, he says, not even in Israel have I found such faith. This is both high praise for the faith of the centurion and at the same time an indictment for the lack of faith that exists in Israel. The delegation returns to the home of the centurion and they find the slave well. So Jesus' power to heal has reached another level. It's not necessary for him to say the words of healing in the presence of the sick person. It is simply enough for him to effect the healing from afar. He truly does have authority over illness. Later Judaism in the Babylonian Talmud records the story of a healing from afar that may date back to the time of Judaism, of Jesus, excuse me. Rabbi Gamaliel's son fell sick. And Rabbi Gamaliel sends two of his disciples to Rabbi Hanina Bendoza, 
who in rabbinic circles of the day was noted for his healing abilities. They request that Rabbi Hanina pray for Rabbi Gamaliel's son. He indeed does pray for Rabbi Gamaliel's son and then tells the disciples to return home. Go, he says, for the fever has left him. They obey and return home to discover that the fever left the boy at the very moment that Rabbi Hanina prayed. A second story of healing, actually raising from the dead, is then narrated. This takes place toward the southern end of Galilee, just outside of the town called Nain, where Jesus encounters a funeral procession of the only son of a widow. This is a particularly difficult situation since widows in that culture were totally dependent on their children, in particular on their sons, for care and for any legal representation. The fact that this widow is burying her only son means that she now has no one to defend her, to watch out for her, to protect her. Some see connection to the Old Testament narratives of Elijah, who raises the son of a widow at Zarephath, 1 Kings 17:17 17, 17 to 24, and Elisha, who raises the son of the Shunammite woman, 2 Kings 4:18 to 37. As one travels in southern Galilee today, you come across the small village of Nain. It is a very small village as shown in this picture. One of the dominant features in the village is a small church, which commemorates the events in this narrative of Luke. When groups arrive to pray at the church, they must pay a visit to the Muslim family who live next door to get the key to the church. Inside the church, a simple sanctuary is there dominated by a painting of Jesus raising the widow's son. On either side of the nave are benches for the faithful to sit. Here is a close-up of the painting hanging, behind, hanging above the altar. Soon afterward, with little time intervening, Jesus goes to a city called Nain which was really probably a small village, generally thought to be six miles northeast of Nazareth and 25 miles from Capernaum. Today the village is known as Nain. He is accompanied by his disciples and a great crowd. This is further testimony to his growing popularity. As Jesus and his followers approach the gates of the town, they encounter a funeral procession. Burials must take place outside of the town, so a meeting at the city gate is in order. Jesus is coming to enter the town, and the procession is departing the town for the burial site. We are told that the man being buried is the only son of his mother, who was a widow. Because of her plight now, the widow's grief must have been great, since in the Old Testament the death of an only son was considered the epitome of great sorrow. For instance, Jeremiah 6.26, Amos 8.10, Zechariah 12.10. The funeral procession is also composed of a large crowd. So when the two groups meet, there are a significantly large number of people. Jesus himself takes the initiative in the narrative. He sees the grief of the widow and has compassion on her and says, Do not weep. From the description above, the emotion of this scene is overwhelming. Jesus reacts with deep emotion. The verb to have compassion is splanknizomai, which we have heard over and over again, which describes an emotion that can only be described as gut-wrenching, emerging from the depth of one's guts. One further point. Luke, at this point, describes Jesus as the Lord, hakurios in Greek. He will continue to use that title in his narrative. Many feel that Luke's use of this title in this manner suggests the authority of Jesus, which is coming to be seen more and more as Luke's narrative unfolds. Bach notes, quote, Luke looks back and characterizes Jesus' acts in terms of the authority that the disciples later came to understand as a reflection of his earthly ministry.
Then Jesus acts. Coming, he touches the bier. According to the law, this act could bring defilement to Jesus. Numbers 19.11 clearly states that he who touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean for seven days. At the moment that Jesus touched the bier, the men carrying the body stopped and stood still. Then Jesus addressed the man, the dead man. Young man, I say to you, arise. This would be construed as an unusual, almost humorous action, were it not for the fact that Jesus actually does possess power even over death, and can thereby pronounce such a command with assurance that it will be fulfilled. The verb used for arise is egero, which is one of the two technical verbs used in this narrative for the resurrection. This action therefore carries overtones of resurrection, but in reality it is merely a resuscitation. The response to Jesus' command is quite startling to those looking on. The dead man sat up and began to speak. Referring to the widow's son as dead man shows us that this is not a healing. It's something totally different, a resuscitation. The proof that Jesus did indeed resuscitate him was that the man did indeed sit up, but also began to speak. Having brought the son back to life, Jesus then restores the living son to his mother. Bach puts it succinctly. The relationship between mother and son, broken by death, is restored by Jesus. Such action closely parallels the action of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. The parallel forms a basis for the people acknowledging Jesus as a great prophet. It would not be hard for one to imagine the reaction of those who were witnesses to this extraordinary event. Luke tells us, fear sees them all. That fear is phobos, which is actually a reverential awe, usually at the workings of the divine. Thus, the fear that seizes the onlookers is an acknowledgement on their part that God is active in what they have just seen. Thus, Luke further describes their reaction as they glorified God, which was a common reaction to the activity of Jesus in Luke's Gospel. Chapter 5, verse 9, chapter 5, verse 26, chapter 9, verse 43, chapter 13, verse 13, chapter 17, verse 18, chapter 18, verse 43, and chapter 23, verse 47. They said, A great prophet has risen among us. It's curious to note that the word for arisen in the popular response is the same as the command Jesus gives to the dead man, from the verb egero. Here it is used in the passive voice, implying that Jesus the prophet has come through the agency of another. Jesus is present and active through the agency of God. The second part of the people's statement is God has visited his people. This reminds us of the canticle of Zechariah in the Benedictus, which begins, Blessed be the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Thus, using the language, that language, the bystanders are recognizing the action of Jesus they have just witnessed as an action of God in their midst. The narrative of raising concludes with a note that the word of what had just happened spread throughout the whole of Judea and the surrounding region, another common Lucan characteristic. Most interpreters see Judea as referring to the region of Galilee and Judea to the south. Thus, the surrounding country would be north of Galilee and east of Judea. Jesus' fame is spreading throughout that whole region. As a look at every unit in the Gospel of Luke would make this study somewhat unwieldy, I've made a decision that for the rest of this study, for the most part, we will concentrate on the texts that appear in the Sunday liturgies. Therefore, from this point forward, I will make reference to the texts that are not in the Sunday liturgy, but will not treat them in detail, as I have done thus far. So, following the raising of the widow's son, 
there is a text on Jesus and John the Baptist, where John sends disciples to Jesus to discover his identity, and then Jesus gives his estimation of John. The mention of the text on John the Baptist brings our current session to a conclusion. In our next session, we'll look at the story of the woman at the house of Simon the Pharisee. Then we will bring the Galilean ministry of Jesus to a conclusion, taking a brief look at Jesus' agrarian parables. Then we will examine the thorny topic of the brothers and sisters of the Lord, and finally look at the narratives that prepare for the journey narrative.